Hello, everybody, and welcome to yet another Friday and yet another MotorOne.com test car happy hour. I'm Seth Mirsma, Editor-in-Chief of Motor One, and we have a full house and lots of cars to talk about today. Um, right now, to my immediate right, I have no idea what you guys are seeing, is uh, Mr. John Neff, Editor-at-Large of Motor One, um, OG of MotorOne.com, and also, <laughs> you know, forever friend of the family. Here to here to talk Thank about you. a few cars he's been driving home uh, while he's home in in Cleveland or around Cleveland, anyways. Um, we've got senior editor Brett Evans, who's who's bringing the noise with a an electric Audi that none of us have have seen before. Uh, and then and then Brandon Turk is Brandon. This is maybe your third or fourth episode. You're gonna have to need a break here pretty soon. This is you've been you've no. Been, I skipped uh, I skipped last week, but I remember you being there last week somehow. <laughs> I was not, but top of the morning. Dang it. Yeah. Yes. And a happy uh, St. Patrick's Day to everybody out there. Uh, thank you for lending us a half hour of your of your time. Uh, hopefully you're not too drunk yet. Or if so, no judgment, really. Um, so as ever, you guys, no matter where you're watching us, if you're seeing this on YouTube, if you're catching us on Facebook or on Twitter or on Instagram, we would love to answer your questions. We'd love to respond to your comments. So as we're chatting, please do leave those wherever you are. You can leave us a question or a comment. We will read it. Uh, super producer Kyle may even put it up on the screen so that I'm forced to read it out loud and all of your wildest dreams will come true. So um, I guess let's start like, as, as long as we have, we have clearance from, from the dog. Let's uh, let's start with Brett. <laughs> Brett, you had a, you had a, a pretty um, awesome experience and opportunity to shoot with a new uh, version of the e-tron that we kind of saw before, but haven't seen for a long time. Yeah, it was kind of cool. So it's it was called the Audi e-tron, Audi RS e-tron project 513 slash um, two. And it takes inspiration from the original e-tron prototype who uh, that came out in two, there, there it is right there. That's the 2018 e-tron prototype. Apparently, Audi of America had tons of interested parties asking if they could get this design scheme on their e-tron. Um, they did it in the indoor car cover that you see right there. And then they also did a limited edition that you see on the screen right there um, with uh, going to be limited to 75 units. It's a fully loaded Audi RS e-tron GT with this wacky, this wacky design scheme going on. So those, um, those silver elements you see are uh, vinyl, like a, a decal applique. And then the, the gloss black is actual, the actual, the car's actual paint. Uh, it's the first Audi, I'm just I'm just reading my script right now at this point. It's the first Audi with red rings that you see right there. Apparently, uh, I, I apparently did some pretty good rehearsing because it's all coming very naturally to me. Um, there's yeah, there's no. some there's there's some Dodge Challenger uh, splitter guard action going on with that front end. So the, uh, I don't disagree. And here's the thing: I actually before I knew that the splitter guards were like supposed to be removed, I thought it was just like a cool design thing that Dodge was doing. <laughs> So I actually dig that they are kind of like going that route with the uh, with the Audi because they're not going to fade like the splitter guards do. They're deliberate. It's an intentional choice. So yeah, no, it was a it was a cool day. Um, this is going to be limited to seventy five units. Uh, it was built between Audi of America and Exclusive, the customization program. So um, every mm -hmm. single one of those seventy five units is going to stay in the United States. Uh, they're all destined for our market, which is kind of. Kind of cool usually with european automakers whenever there's a special edition the us is the the last to get in on it and uh we're the only ones getting in on this one so that's kind of fun yeah this one was really cool so like one just to, to toot our own horn a little bit like we were excited to have this opportunity because we were one of only a handful of uh, i think maybe three um outlets that that were invited to have some time with this car and shoot it um, it is a so so. Let's talk a little bit about it. It is a, it's a stock Etron GT under the wrap, and is that correct, Brett? Yeah, RS Etron, but yeah. RS it's RS. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, very important distinction there uh, in terms of in overall power and price. And then the background here is really just that that owners really loved it, right? I, yeah. Like what we heard from Audi was that they, people were asking for it a lot. Yep. Maybe people had already attempted to recreate this wrap because it was so it was so impactful when they when they debuted it. And so this is this is kind of fan service on a pretty grand yeah. scale. 75 limits or units limit uh, limited to 75 units. But nevertheless, um, yeah. that's a big deal. That's hard to pull off. Right. Well, and, you know, like you see, you see right there, there's that indoor car cover that came out in yeah. 2021, about a year after the e-tron hit the market. They made this indoor car cover 
again, responding to that demand from their customers that wanted something that looked like the prototype. So um, it's clear that like, you know, that like the Etron GT customer has been like asking for this design for a long, long time and that they weren't satisfied enough with the, arc- the car cover that Audi actually had to go build one. Like it's just, it's, it is cool to see the, uh, the manufacturer listening to, listening to their customers um, that much, even though, you know, like you can be really cynical and say, ugh, it's just a wrap. It's just fancy paint. There's nothing about it. Blah, blah, blah. That's like super substantively different from a regular e-tron gt rs e-tron gt but it's still cool it's still cool that they just like listen to their customer enough and just give them a few little design tweaks um well and and yeah. we've seen this you know throughout the history of, of the automobile right like sometimes just special editions whether they are paint and tape or something more substantial become cars that are really important or really sure. sought after down the road neff i'll put you on the spot here because you are a a multiple ev owner is the e-tron gt do we or, sorry is the is the the RS e-tron GT or the e-tron GT in general, is this a car that collectors will care about in 50 years? Like, do we feel like this is a car that's pretty fundamental to the understanding of EVs right now? Or, you know, I think it'll be 50 years from now. I think it'll be one of those cars that, you know, when it pops up on cars and bids or whatever the, the auction site du jour is 50 years from now, people will remember it because it has to currently exist in the shadow of the, of the Porsche Taycan. And I think that's its only fault. It's a it's a wonderful EV, um, but but it kind of came out as the little brother to the to the Taycan. So I like this differentiation. I like it getting special editions. I'm a big fan of vinyl wraps and their explosion in the last few years. Mm-hmm. They've done so much for um, self expression and customization on cars. And I love seeing an automaker lean into it and o- offer something like this. I think it's great. Um, and it does, it looks, uh, it looks wild, um, and different. So, um, you know, will the, will the e-tron RSGT itself be collectible in 50 years? I don't know, but I think this one will. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, and I think that's, you know, again, like it's, it's just a little bit special. It's, it clearly shows that there is an enthusiast audience for at least this, this product right now, right? If this were, more of a commodity car, even at a high dollar, even at a high performance level, I, I don't think that that Audi would go to this trouble. But it does it does say something to me about like what they're willing to invest in the brand of e-tron right now in this kind of early stage, which I think is really cool. And then Brett, remind me, is there so two questions? This isn't going to be offered like the wrap isn't going to be offered any other way, right? Even if it's not yeah. the the limited edition model, there's no way for other e-tron owners to go back and get one. No, and they were, they were pretty clear about that, that like, you know, uh, people that, you know, in, t- in tooting their own horn, they, they were pretty clear that like, oh, if you if you miss out on one of the 75 units, don't worry, you can still go get the indoor car cover as if that would be a suitable <laughs> substitution for someone who wanted their car to look like this. This is, but, this is, this is, this is all just an elaborate ploy to sell more car covers. That's really what it is. <laughs> there you go. Hey Brett, is the is the wrap like one continuous no, piece so, for each section, or or is each silver part its own piece? Yeah, each silver part is its own piece. The the mm. black that you see in there is actual the the um I think it's Mythos metallic black paint, and it's the same that you get on any other Etron um or you know any Audi Audi car period. Um, one kind of weird thing is that rear bumper, the like matte silver rear bumper, that's actually matte silver. That's not a wrap. So they have mixed and matched a little bit, but all these little silver bits that you see are just individual stripes applied by hand or, you know, applied to the paintwork one at a time. So it is kind of amazing that they were able to, that, you know, that they. That, so if um, you took the wraps, if you, if you took the vinyl pieces off, you'd have a black car with a matte gray yeah. bumper. Yep. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is another cool. So just to point out while it's on screen. It has the same matte carbon fiber as any other RS e-tron, but they've applied kind of a similar vinyl um finish to that one um that kind of matches the exterior it, it really was like you know when we first got the opportunity like special editions it's so easy to be cynical about special editions and like when we got the opportunity it was like okay cool we're gonna do it you know it's not gonna be terribly interesting but we're gonna do it and and it ended i ended up really just kind of like buying into the hype it just looks really good and you know like the i think i think personally think the etron gt like is a great variant of the of the ppe platform that it shares with the tycon i really like it a lot and you know the styling is distinct and the interior is completely different and this is just kind of another way of like you know as john was alluding earlier kind of giving audi something special to 
to point to, you know, when they're they're selling. I also, you know, like I I will take ever so slight exception to um, his evaluation that it lives in the Tycon shadow because um, you can get an RS e-tron with Tycon turbo levels of power for the price of a Tycon 4S, which is just like, you know, the value there is is kind of in, kind of incredible if you if you don't need like the Porsche branding or the Porsche design, the value that the e-tron GT offers is kind of incredible. So, um, That's yeah, cool. it was, it I, need, I need the Porsche branding. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. I mean, listen, I might too. I'm not going to lie, but, but the, uh, the, I do like the Tycon a lot. I also really dig one cool thing about, um, this experience is it is we were able to, to film it, um, at the motoring club in Los Angeles, which was a really cool opportunity to actually finally get over to there. They have a new space and it was just really cool to like see their new space. Um, like the, we're, we were filming in their car storage, um, the secured car storage, but then they also have like a club space and a coffee shop and stuff like that. And that was cool just to like hang out with those folks. There was a, there was a, um, custom Daimler 420S Landau Lay, like just some really cool, awesome stuff just like hard parked in the in the in the wow. space so that was a fun experience too it was it was just a cool fun day all around just playing with neat cars yeah i'm i'm glad that you called those guys out so yeah shout out to the motoring club um it was awesome that we were able to work with them we hope to be able to maybe do some more special stuff in that space in the future uh because it was really cool um and and shout out again thanks thanks to audi for including this on this one uh, in, in, including us in this one as well it was fun if you guys are watching this now or after the fact like click the link that we put in the chat here to that video that one came out really really well um so let's move on to a car from a car that's very limited to one brand and that i expect honda thinks will sell more than 75 units it would be failure <laughs> on a grand scale uh if if there were fewer than 75 accords uh sold this year but there's a new accord and, and i mean I they, pr they probably they probably sold 75 in the past hour so <laughs> um... a, a much different volume play here but um let's talk about the everything is a hybrid all the time at honda accord yeah uh so this kind of arrived as, as a surprise i was originally supposed to get a crv <laughs> hybrid and this showed up instead so I was, I'm, I'm excited to spend some time with it um you know there's there's something about the accord every accord i've driven i've probably driven the last four or five generations i think um you get in and it always feels exactly the same when you get in like you just you plop right down like you are deep down in the car you have this thin steering wheel like everything is right where it needs to be it's really really well done it, it drives beautifully um and this one you know it, it stands out a bit because it is it's almost all hybrid all the time um yeah it's this is the so naturally they gave me the most expensive one in the segment <laughs> or in the class. It's a it's a touring trim, so the top end trim, uh, two hundred and four horsepower, two hundred and forty seven pound feet of torque with a two liter direct injected Atkinson cycle four cylinder and an electric motor and a battery and it's just it's just lovely. I mean it, it feels it's the, the the hybrid system is so refined and so smooth and predictable and very easy to manage just with the accelerator pedal like it's got drive modes i haven't touched them because i can pretty much get everything i need out of it just with the accelerator there you don't need to really you know screw around to, if you want to keep it in ev mode or if you want to you know keep the the engine rpms low it's a very very manageable car um on its own and I, I i think that uh completely lost my train of thought is what i think <laughs> i i i remember so i attended the first drive of the last accord the last one that i believe was the 2018 model year i think it was 2017 was the launch program and i remember it wasn't my line but one of the best lines i read of the coverage after the fact was that car was so much better than it needed to be, right? Honda overshot the mark. It was it was Honda over engineering in a way that I don't think they get credit for as much anymore, and probably rightly so. But the thing that built the reputation that was at that time that Accord like set kind of a new high water mark, and and so I'm I'm really excited to hear like positive feedback about this one. I'm honestly I'm really excited to get into this car because I think that it could be low key really excellent for a lot of people um and that's that's something that's getting lost a little bit in the you know like every the whole conversation is around suvs all the time this is a really useful yeah. sized car this is a really it's 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 a really great thing to drive on a day-to-day -day basis i i totally agree and one of the things that like kind of kind of threw me off about this one is that it, it feels much larger than it really is 
Like, mm-hmm. it, it, yeah, it, I, I don't remember mid size sedans feeling this big. This feels like a, this feels like an Avalon competitor, honestly. Um, there's there's just so much space inside of it, and it's it's so pleasant to drive. I just you know, I, I did the first drive program for the new pilot, which is very, you know, has a lot in common with this with this car. Mm-hmm. And I can't I can't imagine getting getting a pilot over over this. This is just it's just more pleasant to live with every day. It's quieter, it's it's more composed, it's not nearly as fussy, it's easier to place on the road. I think it looks better. Um I, I was pretty critical of this car when it debuted, and it it's definitely better looking in person. It's got some real presence in the design. Cool. I, I really dig how um, it's got pretty much the same powertrain as the uh, CRV hybrid. And um, I was, I went into, I, I, I drove this thing a few months before Brandon did, and I was expecting to kind of be let down by it, um, quite honestly, just because I didn't, I didn't love the CRV hybrid. I, I think the hybrid is a little bit unrefined in that, in that application. In the Accord, it's an absolute honey. It's amazing how, how different it feels and it's it's carrying around like 400 fewer pounds but um everything about it is just much smoother and much like better integrated and it feels like a more complete car um you know so so one person who disagrees with you brett as is his want to disagree with one of us on every uh podcast is ekj canadian enthusiast thanks for watching by the way who says the new accord is a letdown in every way compared to the uh last gen it's just a civic xl Camry Sonata and K5 are better. The upcoming Camry will kill the Accord with ease. That's a strong take. Even EKG usually has a little bit, uh, a little bit more kind of nuance for the other brands there. But uh, he's seeing this as a big let I mean, letdown. I, does anybody else feel that would do? Is is that the vibe? Like is so. The, is, I, I I I have I have some news for EKG. Every car is just an XL version of another car. Every BMW, <laughs> every BMW 7 Series is just an XL5 Series. Every you know every equinox is an xl tracks like that's that's just the way the market is you get into these cars and yeah it looks the same and it's got the same software and it's got the same instrument cluster and the same steering wheel it's just it's just a different size sausage that's that's really that's really all it is um i don't think you can say that a product that is not on sale is going to be better than one that is on sale i just and I also that. I also completely disagree that the, the yeah. current Camry is better than the. Oh yeah, no, no way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and, the good, and, the, and the good and the good thing is Jeff Perez is not here to defend that argue, defend that position <laughs> that the Camry is I, better. I think EKG is saying that the next Camry, the upcoming Camry, I, I, I don't, I don't think, I don't think, I mean, maybe sure. That's that's be. yeah, and I think the Red Wings next year are going to be amazing. I have no <laughs> idea. Though. Um, but but um, no, I mean c- compared there. compared to compared to Sonata and K5, I think yeah. it's I think that there's a valid comparison there. I'm yeah. I'm a huge fan of the K5. I know Brett's a big Sonata fan. Um, but, I think both of those cars kind of have a, a more avant-garde, uh, futuristic, sporty yeah. bend to them that, that you don't really get in the Accord. Um, I think the Accord is just very very good. That's really it, it doesn't have a personality. It's it's a bit like a golden retriever. Like it's just it's just a very nice dog. Well, and um, I, yeah, of course. Can, can I say too that I I I like that Honda has kind of taken a step back from the styling edge that it was um, that it approached with the last generation. Um, you know, the last generation I think took some chances styling wise that um, turned off some people um, and probably cost the car some sales. And I think the new look now is. While it's far simpler, it's also a little bit more classic and timeless. Um, the the grill and its shape is almost Acura like to me, which I don't mind. Um, mm-hmm. And I think this will, you know, it's not that it's uh, trying to appease more people. Um, I think it will appeal to more people. Uh, this design than the last generation Accord with its canted forward grill I mean- and and kind of weird weird um, styling. I mean, the, uh, the, pro- the problem is that not everyone thinks the way that we do. And there are, there's, there's a market for very anonymous designs. Um, true. I don't think, like I said, I think the Accord looks good in person. It does not stand out if you park it in a lineup next to K5 and Sonata or even Camry for that matter. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure that that's what this class of, bu- I don't, of buyer is looking for. That's the thing. I don't, I don't think they are. Yeah. Like, I think it's just, it's just yeah. a nice looking car. Yeah. Yeah, I will say that this 
um, with Accord and Pilot, like Honda's, first of all, Honda's launched a ton of products over the last 18 months, basically the last two years. I would say I am not a huge fan of the styling language like in any one of the the examples to be, to be frank i i kind of preferred that slightly more emotional style that they were in in the last generation that being said they maybe you guys tell me if i'm wrong i think that they have one of the most cohesive brand languages right now of any brand right i think that their products yeah. do look like they were all yeah. very intentionally designed and not to look like one another but to share some you see it in the grill you see it in the headlights you certainly see it in the interior you know with the with the wide sort of grill um across the the width of the of the ip um so i i think that what honda is doing is very intentional and considered and i think that you're right like they're probably shooting to um, retain the audience that they have as much as they are to um, to invest in or, or do something that's a little bit more provocative to get a new audience uh, for some of their products, which is an interesting standpoint, as you know, especially now where we've got so many challenger brands and, and lots of different ways to consider buying a car than you had even six years ago, five years ago, um, when when the last the last model line was launching and, and on four courts. So um, you like I just threw out four. I was I was I wasn't like gonna like say, I wasn't gonna say anything. I wasn't gonna say anything. I, I, like, I, I like wonder if it's on camera podcast? though, because I did I did I did kind of give you a side eye there. I think you're Sometimes coming for my punny game, dude. Back <laughs> off. <laughs> um, all right, Mister Neff, let's move on. It's been this is. Uh, I think you, this is your first time on on uh, on this particular podcast. I know that you've joined Rambling About Cars, uh, which you guys should all watch or uh, watch and listen to. Um, but why don't you talk yeah, about the car that you've been driving? You're, you're back home and you're in, you're in, or have been in something that's certainly very budget friendly, right? Yeah. So I've been driving the 2023 Nissan Kicks, um, which I had to uh, reference a, a Motor One article that lists the 20 cheapest cars for sale in the US, and the Kicks is one of them. Um, as far as I could tell from that, article it is the cheapest suv you can buy uh in the u.s with a starting price just over twenty thousand dollars um it undercuts the hyundai view by a little bit and it undercuts the kia soul by um by about a thousand dollars or so uh and to be honest i was kind of charmed by it um it is it is small but it doesn't feel cramped um the cargo space is actually uh, really impressive. Um, I drove a, a new, a brand new Soul right after it, and the the Kicks cargo space was much better than the Souls. Um, the the version I drove was the SR. It was uh, fully loaded, and again, you, you're you're getting um, a large number of really desirable features, like a heated steering wheel, which I very much appreciated. You get a 360 degree camera, uh, which I again very much appreciated. Um, you get remote start. Um, but the charming part of the car was how it drove. I actually thought it was really fun to drive. It it definitely, um, I think, took advantage of its small car footprint. And it had uh, kind of quick steering. And the suspension, I'm not going to call it firm, but it wasn't sloppy. Um, it definitely felt like it was there to support you in the corners uh, for having a little fun. So um, it does have a CVT transmission, but it's not super powerful. It didn't, it didn't get in the way. I didn't feel like, like it was um, bogging me down or, or sapping the fun out of the driving experience. It did have a few negatives though. Um, it was, it had, the engine is loud and the road noise definitely comes through, um, which was super evident when I drove the new soul after it, which is extremely quiet inside. Um, and probably the thing I like least about the Nissan Kicks is its infotainment system, which looks and feels extremely old. Um, it's got pretty low res graphics. It's a small screen. It is touch screen and you do have Apple CarPlay, but only by wire, uh, not wireless. Um, and so that kind of Get, that kind of pops me out of the experience of driving a new car when I feel like the infotainment system uh, looks and acts like it's uh, five years old already. Um, but other than that, like I said, I for for um, someone's first car um, or a second car as a runabout, it's it's a really uh, great option. And I feel like I've had 
I, I've been very hard on Nissan in the past with its cars, and this one kind of um, turned that around for me um, and really uh, appreciated how far they've come and how much value they have. It's certainly, I mean, uh, it sounds like, sounds like the value is there, but I mean, I can't tell you the last time that we talked about, I don't think we have on this podcast talked about a car that was, I don't know the sticker on yours, John, but I'm looking like, I know this one can retail like right around 21 grand. Um, right. So like it can be, it can be very inexpensive. Um, yeah. the, the one thing you, you mentioned the, the power trader refinement, the one thing that like, cause I have not driven this car, but the, the big fear that I would have getting into it is that it's that 1.6 liter four, right. With the, the CVT that, that strikes me as, as one of the least refined power trains that somebody could buy in a, in a passenger car in a car today. Am I, am I a hundred percent wrong there or. No, you're, I, like I said, that was one of my demerits for it was, yeah. was the, the kind of the engine noise. And, and um, I mean, you know, I, I kind of chalked it up to, yeah, it's a, the engine's a little bit unrefined, but it's a cheap car. So you're not getting a lot of sound deadening either. Um, mm -hmm. So you just, you just don't feel isolated from either uh, road noise or engine noise. Um, but I will say I had it parked at my parents' house because we've been staying there. They live in a 55 and older community. It got the, the styling and the color mm -hmm. got tons of thumbs up from the over 55 crowd uh, in Lorain, Ohio. Uh, and I actually uh, agree. I, I think the styling is, is uh, good and fun and, and sharp looking. Um, so, so I think it has a lot to offer. It's just... With average car transaction prices at forty thousand dollars now, you know, automakers are kind of abandoning cars this size very quickly. And you know, that list of the cheapest cars in America, you know, the cheapest one on the bottom, the floor keeps creeping up and up. And you know, soon it's going to be eighteen thousand, nineteen thousand, twenty thousand. So I appreciate cars like this, where you can get a totally new car. Um, for, you know, as an option, instead of looking at something, you know, used, that's a little cheaper or something. Um, yeah, this is, and like I said, it was, been, it was fun. This has been Nissan's beat for a little while. And it is interesting. The question of how long they'll be able to continue being a player in this, like, you know, the, the, the very bottom uh, entry level segment is interesting. I remember the Nissan Versa famously being offered for five bucks under 10 grand for a yeah. little while in the, in the early two thousands. Right. Like that was, it was not a new model at that point. It was entirely like a, a, a price play. Um, and that's a car that they, they ended up selling a lot of, I don't know. I don't know the overall satisfaction level of the people who bought those cars, but this is, this is not a, a, a segment that Nissan has found profitable in the past. So um, but and you raise this, a good point. I think, There's a lot more meat on the bone today than there was 20 years ago, yeah. 10 years ago, right? And and unlike the Versa, which if you got a loaded Versa, it still felt like a cheap car. This yeah. has so many luxury features. I forgot to mention, it comes with the Bose. Uh, the, the upgraded Bose. stereo is a Bose system with the in-speaker, or sorry, in-headphone, wait, in-headrest speakers. Um, I was going to so ask if it that's had the that. That's Yes. And it yeah, was, I was cool. gonna ask about it, that because Jeff, Jeff raved about it. Jeff raved yeah. about it. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, like, you know, I get I get into this car that I'm expecting to be a cheap economy car, and I've got uh, a Bose stereo in the headrests, I've got a heated steering wheel, I've got 360 degree camera, heated seats. You know, I you know, like I said, unlike the Versa, which you just you couldn't ever get contented up to that point. This, you know, has more than some competitors costing three, four, five thousand more. I can tell you now that the Kia Soul doesn't come with a heated steering wheel anymore. You can't get it at any price. Yeah, it's it's kind of funny that you mentioned the Versa because I I went on a Nissan program at my former um, my former outlet where they brought all of their cars that cost less than twenty thousand dollars, which at the time included the very basic bare bones version of the Frontier. Um, and, mm -hmm. uh, the, their whole deal was what kind of a Nissan you could get for 20 grand. And so they had the kicks, That's the cool. Versa and the frontier, the Versa that they had was the, the current generation that was fully loaded with all these features. And you could still get it at that time. I think it's creeped just over 20 now, but at that time it was like 198 with destination for, like you said, something with heated seats and a, and a decent stereo. It didn't have the speakers, but, um, you know, had a lot of features, um, and then, you know, they, they also brought a base uh, kicks out that was maybe 19.8, same, similar price. And even at the base level, like it still was like silly to drive. It was fun and responsive and, and the, the steering and suspension felt like 
you know, nippy to use an overused phrase. Um, it was just like a, it's a fun little, fun little package. If you don't, if you don't need a lot of power, which let's be honest, most of us don't in our normal commuting. Yeah. That's another, that's another question I have about this one. And, and maybe we can, I don't think we have an article here, but maybe we can find it off air. Uh, but so this thing I'm seeing has 122 horsepower. I wonder what on sale today has fewer than 122 Mirage. horsepower? Mirage. Mirage. Okay. Yeah. 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 All right. I think, so I think let me, let me, is let me, least powerful car. The answer is always Mirage. Mirage. Yeah. Let me go <laughs> well, back to the list of cheapest cars and I'll tell you. Yeah. It's, that's it's right, yeah. Mirage Speaking is of, down there. Kia Rio, I maybe. Would, I would not wish a Mirage on my worst enemy. <laughs> All right, we'll have to get a mirage in, in, in through the fleet. So maybe I can be the sacrificial lamb. Hey, one. Brandon, it's been, I, it's been ages. I, I, I might need another vehicle if you want to punish me with that. That'd, that'd be fun. I, I you wanted know, we, to be got... like a mirage, but I, there's just no love there. I wanted it to be like a fun hate watch of a car, but boy, no, yeah. it's, not, it's, it's, it's not even that. We've, we've got a category, and this is more for the listeners than for you guys. We have a category in our rating spreadsheet where one of the boxes you can tick is if horses were this bad, we or if uh, the first cars were this bad, we'd still be riding horses. And the Mirage is a <laughs> car that I had the only car with that box that. inspired it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, so so we'll, we've got one more car to talk about too. I want to I want to rewind quickly just because I missed a few comments. First of all, JW Kirk says hi to Brett specifically. It says hey to Brett specifically. So I do not want to miss that one. I saw uh, that. Hey, man. How's it going? J Dubs 07 said that he saw, and we don't have to go in detail, but that he saw a quarter passing and that he was getting A7 vibes from the, I can, the taillights, I can see that. I can which see I can that. see. It's a compliment. I think that probably a, probably a good catch. Um, hello, as ever, to Kevin Hawthorne from Lakeland, Florida. Glad that you were able to tune in. Um, all right. And so let's get let's get on to the Ford. Another, uh, well, I, will say, I was going to say the segue here is that it's another sort of budget-friendly car that I'm in. And you can certainly make the argument that the Ford Bronco Sport is a budget-friendly car and probably um, re really excellent, like even in more of a budget-friendly way. The one that I'm driving right now, the one that's in my driveway, is the Heritage Limited Edition or Limited Version. Um, it's, it's just cute as a button. I don't know that I would ever buy it in, the, in, this, uh, in this color or Honestly, even with the white wheels, I love them, but I don't know if I love them enough to live with them. But I have to say from the top, my jaw literally dropped when I saw that it, this one is $46,000, <laughs> like as it Ooh. stands. So, so the, the Heritage Limited, just to be clear, has, um, it has the Heritage package. So it has this special Robin's egg paint and those white wheels and the contrasting roof and some other things um, that are supposed to be kind of evocative of the 66 or 67 Bronco. Um, and, and I think pulls it off based on the feedback that I was getting. It's also loaded inside, right? So, and again, maybe one of you guys can correct me if I'm, if I'm exactly it's, wrong here, but it's very close to having everything you can get on a Bronco. It Explorer. is. So it is, it's, there are two versions of the heritage. There's the yep. base Bronco heritage, which or Bronco sport heritage, which is based off of the big bend. Um, yep. which is kind of like the volume spec with the 1.5 liter, three cylinder turbo, then there's the Heritage Limited that you have. That is the two liter. It's based off of the Badlands. It's got it's got all the goodies. Um, yeah, yeah, leather. So so it's obviously got leather. It's got the bigger engine. It's all wheel drive. Um, it's got um, you know the the newest, actually pretty great infotainment system. I've had I've had really good luck with with Ford's uh, infotainment system across various products too. So I really like it. But mostly. I was shocked. This is my first Bronco Sport Drive. Period. Um, this car is amazingly fun to drive. <laughs> I was it, it blew my mind that this car was is as entertaining to drive as it is. Again, the two liter EcoBoost, so two liter turbo with it's like two hundred forty five horsepower and two hundred and eighty or seventy five pound feet of torque or something like that. Tons of power. Feels really quick off the line. It certainly. I don't know what it does zero to sixty, but it, I can promise you it feels quicker than than how it measures out. Um, it does have, as Brandon has pointed out and I've tried out, it's on top of that, it has kind of amazing suspension compliance too. So the ride quality, um, especially this time of year in Michigan, winter turning into spring, the roads are all over the place. Everything is broken. Potholes are as wide as you'll see them all year. This thing is soaking those up really easily. And yet when I took it, because it's fun to drive on the river road, it's soft and it's a little bit floppy, but it's really entertaining to drive too. So like those combinations of things were not what I was expecting out of the, out of the Bronco sport at all. Um, and was very pleasantly surprised. 
so I wanted to point out it looks like the upholstery is slightly different on so my familiarity with this is because we have a Bronco Sport on order to for my wife's next car. It's being built at the end of the month. So I've been pouring over the configurator and everything like that. It looks like the Heritage has some unique upholstery. Um, like the patterning on there yeah. looks really, really like kind of a vaguely plaid really pattern. Attractive. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's it's really neat too. It's hard to see and the I was trying to focus always as I do these too, but the the um they're vented seats or actually i should no, they're say not that. they're, they're, not they're definitely heated they have they're perforated seats they're not vented yeah. they're perforated seats and they've they worked the perforations into that design that does look kind of like a really wide oh, nice. kind of uh uh plaid pattern it's really subtle and you can see it in different like kind of changes with the light um but it's a nice it's a nice nod to the to the heritage aspect of the vehicle um you guys can also see this back here too. I'm a, I'm a big sucker for like cargo organizers. That makes sense. This is the only option on this car. It's 150 bucks. I can't imagine getting it without it at 150 bucks because um, it divides that a good size cargo bay in half so that you're able to have like a shelf up there and, and have a little bit of either um, uh, just privacy or security for whatever you put underneath it too, which I think is really nice. Plus it's rubber, it's hard rubber. So you're not going to really be able to ruin it if you're throwing like me car seats or strollers or things back there. So, so a, a couple of things that like, it, it really drew me to it. And, you know, I was, I was surprised it, it drew my wife in too, is that, you know, Ford's lack of configurability on this car is really interesting relative to like a Jeep, like a compass, because mm -hmm. it is essentially, you pick a trim, you pick a color, there's like one maybe two packages and that's and that's pretty much it like it's a very very like there's a very limited number of configurations in it and all of them from from the very base car to the most entertaining one is you get that same suspension for the most part i think the badlands is a slightly different suspension but that general compliance um, mm -hmm. that Seth was talking about you get that across the board there are all these like really clever features like the lifting the lift up glass at the at the back um, you can get all of them with that you know that cargo shelf that accessory package it's just it's it's such a smart you know fun little thing mm -hmm. that it everything feels very thought out in it like I you know we went to look at it and uh, my wife lost her mind. The, the the back pockets, the seat back pockets are zippable. Like they, yeah. they zip up. Like it's just, it's such a simple little thing, but it's like, oh wow, that's, that's great. I could fit a laptop in there, zip it up. No one would know it was there. It's perfectly safe. Um, They've got yeah, the little pockets on the side of the seats for like, if you're charging a device and not like they, there's wireless charging up front, but let's say like the kids have a phone or, or the passenger has a phone on the side of the pockets there. Uh, sorry. On the side of the seats, there are little pockets for putting stuff in there. It's, it's, it's clever packaging. We've seen and talked about this a lot before with like Ford Maverick, for instance, where Ford I think is, is thinking, I don't know, like they're thinking a little bit more like Honda circa 1999 in my mind, in terms of like, how do we create a really pleasant and super useful space for a larger number of people? The other thing, though, I have to point out here, too, because it's this is a car that's a little deceptive. It's got a little bit of the um, God, now I'm going to forget it. What's the, the TARDIS effect? Is that what is that the, the <laughs> Doctor Who thing? Yeah. Where it, yeah. It, it seems much smaller to me. It seems much smaller on the road than it does inside. I have not great room, but again, six foot five, large kids, big, big car seats. I have a good amount of room in the rear seats with the car seats back there to still drive the car. And moreover, I was shocked when I had this, I didn't take a picture of it, but when I have this parked in the driveway next to my wife's 17 Audi Q5, in my mind's eye, this is a class down from it. But the reality is there, the, the Bronco Sport is actually larger. It's taller for sure. And it's, and it's, I think longer as well, longer and wider. So um, well, it's not that small. It just the looks thing that's really crazy. I want to say I and I might be I might be talking out of my ass here, like, but I I think I re referenced it in the first drive. This thing is like ten inches shorter than an Escape. Like it is, it is a lot smaller than an Escape. I was just going to ask though, haven't there been rumors? I don't think it's officially confirmed, but that the the Escape and the Edge are being discontinued in favor of the Bronco Sport and the Bronco. I think in their current gas only for I think I don't mm -hmm. I don't. There's no way Ford's going to abandon that seat, that compact CUV segment. I think it's just this will be the last generation for it. They just did a facelift, so it's going to be around for another two or three years. And I think they'll do a all electric version, like a all an e escape. Um, and, uh, <laughs> see, gotcha. see, come on, Brett, I mean, get on my level. <laughs> oh my 
God. Well done. So, all right, we're, we're, we're running a little bit over as promised, but one more question for you guys, $46,000, right? And again, I'm not trying to beat this up on price. It's as, it's as expensive as you can get it, but $46,000. Do you like a loaded Bronco sport or a kind of base, almost base big Bronco? Go around the room. Oh, that's hard. I, I, didn't I mean, that was the question you were going to ask. <laughs> I mean, so here, so here's the thing. And like, again, I'm, I'm a bit nerdy about this. 46 grand on a big Bronco is still a very well-equipped Bronco. Yeah. Like yeah, you that you can still, you can still get like a, a two door decently equipped Badlands for, for, for $46,000. So if, if that's, if that's the metric, like, yeah, I'm going to take the, the big one all day, but I also have a small one on order. So <laughs> Yeah, I've kind of I've kind of made my decision, I, or my I wife made the decision. For, I would kill for Ford to figure something out like the uh, Jeep Renegades, like like sky panel removable roof thinger. I would mm-hmm. love that if they could do that. Then that would be like my ideal. But as John Neff and I have vehemently disagreed in the past, I love convertibles. I love open open cars, and so I would do a big Bronco for sure. I I would do a big Bronco as well, and I think it's not a fair comparison because this is the special heritage edition. So it has a premium even above the, um, the fully loaded regular uh, Bronco sport. But what that's, I would do. That's, that's oh, not right. totally true, but. Oh, it isn't. Well, no, you can I get it. Thinking... You can get the heritage stuff on a, on a lower trim, or you can get this one, which is the limited with the, with the heritage stuff as well, which is more expensive. Well, the I really, limited I... is even more expensive than a Badlands, though, right? The Badlands tops out at like forty. Yeah, yeah. that's right. So you're, you're that's, that's what I was just pulling off for, for limited stuff. For I, I I really like I really like the heritage edition in other color combinations. What I would do is I would wait thirty years and buy a low mileage example for like ten thousand dollars. <laughs> there you go. That's what yeah. I would do. <laughs> So, so real quick, I think those are all valuable answers. Uh, we've got J Dub saying, and this is hilarious. I'm no Toyota fan. I think they phoned it in, but a forty six thousand dollars asking price for a Bronco Sport is pretty rude. How about the Rav Four TRD off road in comparison? Hopefully cheaper. I'm looking at it now. I haven't like this. We, the question always comes down to spec for spec, but it's that one starts at thirty six thousand dollars. From what I'm seeing on that, we did US we side. did a, we did a comparison and a video with uh, Bronco Sport First Edition, which is basically the same thing as Seth's Heritage in like a different aesthetic yeah. um, with uh, Rav Four TRD off road, and the Toyota got trounced. We Ooh. did a we did a drag race out on the dirt, and it was like not even a question as to which one Kyle, was faster. Yeah. Kyle's going to find that video and link it in the in the comments too, so y'all can and check for, that out. For what it's worth, J Dub, I am I'm calling Ford weekly asking about the heritage spec on the big Bronco because <laughs> I want I want to drive that one. Um, and then real quick, J W Kirk again says base Bronco for me. I think a lot of us. I think we're all going base big Bronco here. Um, I do love to see the rear glass on the sport. That's something that I've been missing from the CUV SUV for a long time. Golf clap. Yes, we all we all like opening, uh, be able to open the rear glass, or we really like it when it just goes down into the into the yeah, like a forerunner, forerunner. There we go, forerunner style. Um, you guys, thanks everybody for joining. Thank you all uh, for the, the great number of questions and comments here. I want to say one one important bit of housekeeping. I sort of previewed this last time. Maybe this is why we got uh, started with a small audience. We are moving this podcast. We are going to move the live version of this podcast starting next week to Thursdays at 2.30 Eastern, 1130 Pacific time. So you can still join us. We're still going to promote it on the site and social. Hopefully you guys catch it there if you're not watching this. Um, and then we are also bringing it to audio streaming as well. Finally, that's that's going to happen. Uh, so um, by the time you hear this, if you're catching this later, you should be able to check on iTunes, on um, Spotify, on the major streaming platforms. We'll be pushing this podcast out as well. It's going to be on the Motor One. It's going to be on the same feed on the Motor One podcast feed, the same one that you're getting rambling about cars right now. So if you are a rambling about cars audio subscriber, uh, you can choose to listen to Test Car Happy Hour uh, if you like or not, but you're getting double the content uh, every week starting next week, which is super exciting. Um, but yeah, in the meantime, uh, John, so great to have you. I think that we're going to try and chat cars at least one other time here in the near future, but but awesome to see your face and get your impressions. Brett and Brandon, as ever, awesome to see you guys. Um, I hope everybody has a fantastic weekend and an awesome St. Patrick's Day. Do not drive if you're drinking. Please have a beer. Have two. Don't drive if you're drinking. Call an Uber, call Lyft, call a friend. 
Um, but have a fun time. And we'll see you next week, Thursday.